We welcome you. Thank you. Thank you, Andile. It's a, a real pleasure to be here um, and to be part of the NACCW conference. Um, I'm a huge fan of your work um, in the life space of children and the safe parks movement. Um, yeah, so real, a real pleasure to be here today. Um, and today I'm going to be sharing findings from the 2020 issue of the South African Child Gauge, um, which was led by Professor Julian May of the University of the Western Cape um, and Chantal Witten, who is a dietitian and uh, lecturer in health science education at the University of the Free State. Um, and really what I've shown today is the fruits of a collaboration with over 60 authors from universities around the country, bringing together many different disciplines and sectors to develop a really holistic understanding of what is happening um, for the nutrition and food security of South Africa's children. So why should we care about child malnutrition? In South Africa, we know that we are experiencing what is called the double burden of malnutrition. Um, so there we're distinguishing between undernutrition, um, where children are not getting enough nutrients to thrive um, and grow and develop healthily, and overnutrition, um, where children are getting too much of the wrong kinds of food um, to grow and thrive. Um, so if we look at the data from the 2016 South African Demographic Health Survey, um, you'll see that wasting and underweight are, are not of serious concern, a public health concern in South Africa. But we are very, very worried about the one in four young children who are stunted or short for their age. Um, and these very high rates of stunting in South Africa have remained stubbornly unchanged for over 20 years. Um, so there's a, a real question about why are we doing so badly um, and what needs to change. Um, and at the same time, we're equally concerned about the growing problem of overweight and obesity, which is affecting one in eight of our young children. Um, and what we know about nutrition is that these early experiences of either and or overnutrition cast a long shadow across the life course. Um, so a mother who is undernourished or pregnant who's undernourished is more likely to have a low birth weight baby. And those low birth weight babies are more likely to be stunted children, and stunted adolescents. And, and in a sense, what you're starting to see is an intergenerational cycle um, where the health needs, the nutrition of the mother starts to impact on the health and nutrition of her children and her grandchildren. Um, we also know that stunted children have greater risk of becoming overweight or obese as adolescents and of developing what we call diet-related non-communicable diseases, such as diabetes and heart disease. And we know that these very same NCDs are increasing the risk for severe COVID infection and hospitalization. So if we want you to start to break this, this cycle of poor nutrition and poor health, we really need to intervene very, very early on in childhood. Um, and perhaps what's also important to understand is that children who are undernourished, who are stunted, um, which is a sign of chronic long-term nutrition, they're not simply short for age. Um, what's also happening is that stunting is stunting the developing brain in ways that makes it difficult for children to move. It has implications for education, and their employment prospects. So there's also a link between undernutrition in early childhood and generational transfer of, of poverty. So one of the first very key messages coming through the gauge is this need to intervene early 
in the life course to break the cycle of Norwegian. Um, we also know that South, South Africa is quite unusual um, in that it has both this high burden of under and over nutrition. So you can see the areas um, highlighted in purple on the global map where we have this, this double burden of stunting and, and overweight. Um, and also anemia, so micronutrient deficiencies in, in adult women in particular, which again has implications for, for the health and, and optimal development of children. What we also know is that rates of overweight and obesity are increasing rapidly over time. So here we're looking at overweight um, in children from the age of five to 19. So these, these are your older children and adolescents. Um, and you can see that girls are far more affected by overweight and obesity than boys and that rates have escalated from below 10% to close to 30% from 2000 to 2015. We're seeing a similar pattern, um, gender bias um, with adult women, um, also more likely to be experiencing overweight and obesity than men. Um, and again, a significant increase over time. So over 60% um, of adult women are overweight in South Africa. And that's, that, that's a real concern when we understand those links with non-community diseases. Again, increasing over time. And here in this final graph, we're looking at um, obesity affecting over 30%, close to 40% of adult women. And then very high and increasing rates of diabetes. Um, and this is a concern not just for the individual um, woman and or child, but it is also of concern because it places a significant burden, um, cost burden on the healthcare system. So we chose to call this issue of the child gauge, we chose to focus it on, on this concept of a slow violence of malnutrition. Um, and this concept was first developed by Rob Nixon to describe what's been happening with climate change um, and how the impacts of climate change have tended to be concentrated within poorer communities, um, that the change has happened very, very slowly and gradually over time. So very often we haven't been aware of the extent of the damage um, or it's been happening on the periphery, on the edges of society um, with um, or two communities who don't have a very powerful voice in, in political and economic decision making. So when we talk about slow violence and malnutrition, we're looking at the way in which it is causing um, often permanent um, damage to the developing body and the developing brain. Very, very, very slowly. So, so, so it's not necessarily clearly visible. Um, and it's a delayed destruction, um, which is very often not being recognized as violence at all. Um, and we're, we're wanting certainly our audience, particularly of policymakers, to understand the, the very real damage that malnutrition is causing our children. So what are the drivers of child malnutrition in South Africa? Um, back in 2010, UNICEF developed a conceptual framework to help us understand some of the key drivers. Um, and at the top of the diagram, you'll see that malnutrition is, is driven by two immediate causes. The one is inadequate dietary intake, so not having um, sufficient food or the right kinds of food or a diverse enough diet um, for optimal growth and development. And it may equally be driven by, um, by disease and infection. So for example, a child who experiences diarrhea um, is likely to lose a significant amount of weight and it is quite challenging or difficult to help that child catch up um, the weight that they have lost. 
Um, we also know that disease makes children more vulnerable to malnutrition and malnutrition itself makes children more vulnerable to disease. So we start to see a cycling of, of malnutrition and infection. Um, and at the level of the household um, or the community, we would be concerned about inadequate access to food, but also inadequate access to care. Um, so responsive caregiving is an, an important element, um, recognizing um, when a child needs to be fed, particularly with, with, with early infant feeding um, and responding to that need. So the, the, the care um, element is really important um, and maternal depression can make it very difficult for mothers to respond appropriately or feed appropriately. Um, and then and also insufficient access to healthcare services and unhealthy living conditions. And we know that um, those kinds of challenges tend to cluster um, in, in certain communities um, and that they are rooted um, in political and economic and, and historical inequalities. Um, so we also need to look at the structural drivers that, that underpin um, the patterns of, of, of underweight and obesity. Um, if we're looking at South Africa, we know that 60% um, of children are living below the poverty line. Um, we're looking at roughly 30% of children who do not have water on site. And sorry, just trying to be able to see my slides as we talk. Um, and then one in 10 children without electricity, which is a problem in terms of refrigeration and keeping foods safe and to prevent things like diarrhea. Um, and one in five children living far from, from their health facility. So these kinds of challenges again tend to cluster um, on, on, on particular in particular communities or, or groups of children, and they create, um, in a sense, a knock-on effect um, or cumulative pattern of disadvantage over time. Um, we also know that, that individual food choices are shaped in very powerful ways by the local food environment. So here we're looking at a spaza shop, and, and if you look at the shelves, many of those, those products are highly processed foods and um, they're filled or they're very high in salt, sugar, um, trans um, and saturated fats, all of which are bad for children's health and are obesogenic. And these are the foods um, that are widely available, um, that are cheap, that are convenient, um, and that are really flooding our local markets um, in ways that are really, really damaging for children's health. So we need to also interrogate the role of this broader global food system um, and big multinational corporations um, that, that dominate that system and that are producing these, these, these unhealthy ultra-processed foods. Um, and that are very explicitly trying to expand their markets in the global south and are also um, targeting children as an emerging market. So, so that very first introduction to very sweet, salty food sets a taste um, for, for those kind of foods across the life course. Um, we also need to pay attention to the impact of COVID-19. So what we've seen over the past year is a significant rise in food prices, um, together with rising unemployment, um, affecting up to nearly 50% um, of, of work seekers, with women far more likely to have lost their jobs than men. At the same time, we saw the closure of schools and ECD programs, which removed an essential daily meal or source of nutrition support, um, particularly for children living in poor households. And as a result, we saw a rise in child hunger 
um, which was affecting 15% of, of households um, in April, May 2021. So that's one in seven households that reported a child had gone hungry in the week preceding the survey. Um, and globally, there were or have been projections of a 14% increase in wasting. Um, and wasting is a particularly severe form of acute malnutrition, um, which is the key driver of, of under five mortality in South Africa. And in fact, 50% of all child deaths in hospital in South Africa are associated with either severe or moderate acute malnutrition. So malnutrition is of serious concern, and particularly now in the context of COVID. Um, here we're looking at data from NIDSCRAM um, with close to 50% of households running out of money to buy food during hard lockdown, um, child hunger remaining unacceptably high, and equally important, uh, an expectation that child hunger will in intensify in the coming months due to the decrease in the need of energy, um, which is currently valued at 460 months, which is equivalent to 15 months a day. Um, and this has failed to keep pace with, with food price inflation. Maybe a litre of same time um, and and the CSG has remained stubbornly below the food poverty line so we know that children are not getting um, adequate the, 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 the grant is not providing an adequate foundation for for good nutrition Um, the other thing that we've seen over the last year is the way in which um, poor households or poor families have tried to shield their children from the effects of, of the pandemic um, by shifting the kinds of foods that they buy. So more and more families are, are buying starch, 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 um, and doing away with proteins um, that are contain the both the macro and micronutrients that children need to, to thrive. Um, so a real sense that families are, are stretched to the limit. Um, and then last but not least, we have seen this again, disruption in children's access to healthcare services. Um, and whilst there have been some improvements in immunization coverage, because there's been a big immunization drive, we haven't seen um, nutrition interventions such as vitamin A supplementation, deworming, and food supplementation. Um, we haven't seen them lead pre-pandemic levels. So there's also a concern that those children who are, are hungry and malnourished are not accessing healthcare services and are therefore not being counted and, and not receiving the kind of support um, that they need. Um, so I guess another key call coming through this issue of the child gauge is, is a call to strength and surveillance systems. Um, and to ensure that those children are identified at community level um, and, and linked up to support. So there are three guiding principles um, for action, for moving forward, for taking on this, this very complex challenge. Um, the first is, is this strong call to intervene early. Um, and this means intervening early, even preconception. Um, in order to improve um, the health of adolescent girls and women um, so that we have a strong foundation for, for pregnancy and, and for fetal development. 
um, and then to continue that support through pregnancy and the first thousand days. And then there's already a, a very clear package of services and interventions that should be developed, so delivered primarily through health, um, but also um, looking at things like mental health, screening and support, um, parenting education, um, and, and access to childcare. Um, and really important to not just intervene early, but to sustain that intervention across the life course um, for not just infants and young children, but also older children and adolescents. The second key concept is to adopt a double duty action approach. Um, so we want you to make sure that every intervention that we put in place not only addresses undernutrition, but also um, protects children from overnutrition. So, um, for example, we know that breastfeeding um, is particularly effective um, in promoting optimal growth and development. It also prevents infection, um, and it has been found to lessen the risk of overweight and obesity later in life. So this would be a, a key example of a double duty action. Um, but equally important, if we're thinking about school feeding, we need to make sure that the foods or the meals that we put on offer um, are healthy meals um, that are not full of um, sweet, salty, fatty foods that can, well, they may address the problem of malnutrition, but they actually increase the burden of over, overweight and obesity. And so a real call to interrogate all our different interventions to make sure that they support this, this WT action approach. And then the third call is to build a child-centered food system. So it's really recognizing that we need to put the child at the center of our efforts to improve nutrition and food security in South Africa. And that in order to do that, we have to pull together um, a whole range of different role players. Um, we need to bring in health and healthcare services. We need to look at what's happening in schools. And we need to look at the kinds of foods um, that are stocked in shops and restaurants um, and create incentives for more healthy options um, or um, subsidies to make healthy foods more affordable. We need to engage with the agri-food agri industry um, who are responsible for, for developing those, those, those products. Um, and we also need to improve access to jobs and to social protection in, in the form of grants, um, given the very, very high levels of child poverty in South Africa. And last but not least, we need to be thinking very carefully about the nutritional needs of children um, in our humanitarian relief efforts. So thinking about um, what goes into those food parcels and are they healthy and appropriate um, especially for infants and young, young children. So the gauge identifies seven opportunities for intervention. Um, the first is a call to invest in maternal health and nutrition. Um, and this is because women's nutritional needs increase quite dramatically um, during pregnancy because obviously they're, they're, they're not only only, uh, but that if they're growing, the growing baby, um, and there's a real danger of micronutrient deficiencies, um, which are a threat to the health of mum and baby. Um, but we also know that food insecurity um, increases the risk of um, maternal mental health disorders such as depression, which may then undermine their capacity to both feed and, and care for for their their children. So we need to be providing micronutrient supplements, making sure that women are accessing antenatal care really early um, within the first 20 weeks. And um, we need to be also monitoring weight gain and providing appropriate dietary counseling so that women um, don't become overweight and obese during their pregnancy. And we need to extend social assistance um, to pregnant women um, 
So there have been numerous calls to extend the CSG um, or offer that much more earlier um, during pregnancy or to introduce a maternity grant that provides income support and addresses this, this very real concern about food insecurity during, during pregnancy. And, and then we need to be screening for, for mental health and domestic violence and making sure that, that women receive support early on. Um, uh, that, yeah, so that they're not carrying those problems forward with them once the child is, is born. Um, then the next step is to think about infant and young child feeding practices. Um, we know that breastfeeding is, 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 gives children the best possible start in life, um, and yet infant well, breastfeeding rates um, in South Africa are, are low, way below the World Health Organization's target of 50%. Um, and we also know that only one in four children, older infants from six to 23 months, are being fed a minimum, of, a minimum acceptable diet. Um, that means that they're not getting a diverse enough diet with many different kinds of food to ensure that they, they access all those micronutrients, the vitamins and the minerals, um, but also that they are receiving meals frequently enough. So very young infants should be fed at least five times a day, small meals, because they have very small stomachs. And so there's also a, a question around frequency. Um, and then last but not least, we know that one in three children under two are already eating salty snacks and sugary foods that are likely to, to set them up for developing overweight and obesity later in life. So we need to be increasing support for breastfeeding women um, within the home, within the community and in the workplace. And we also need to be monitoring um, babies' growth regularly so that we can identify um, exactly when children's growth starts to falter um, and we can take action immediately um, to ensure that they, they catch up their growth and that they're referred to um, support. Um, whether that's through the CSG or through um, DSD's food relief programs. Step three is to invest in early childhood development. Um, and we know that the ECD subsidy is, is intended to promote more equitable access to um, ECD programs in South Africa. And that 40% of that subsidy is meant to um, contribute to a, a daily meal. Um, but at the same time, because the registration requirements are so challenging, um, those centers who serve, who are serving children most in need are, are least likely to have access to that subsidy. And in fact, it's only reaching 10% of preschool children, whereas the NSMP, the National School Nutrition Program, is supporting 77% um, of school children. Um, and we also know that in addition to the challenges of registration, there's a, a means test. So individual children and their families um, need to provide evidence um, that they qualify for the subsidy and that means test is not aligned with the CSG. Um, so there's a real need to iron out those challenges um, and, and particularly to align um, the means test with the CSG or to allow children grant recipients to immediately qualify for the ECD subsidy. Step four, I think, <laughs> is to use schools more effectively to enhance the nutrition of older children and adolescents. Um, we know that the NSCMP provides a daily meal to over 9 million learners, and it's been found to improve punctuality, attendance, and, and concentration in class. But it was suspended during COVID-19 lockdown, and it was only reinstated after Equal Education and Section 27 took the Minister of Education 
application to court. And even following um, the reinstatement of the NSNP, we're still not seeing full coverage. Um, and for example, in the Western Cape, where the NSNP actually ran through lockdown, um, we are still only looking at roughly 50% of children receiving a daily meal through the NSMP. Um, and that's because of the very real challenges of, of um, classes rotating um, and then of the distances and logistics um, of getting food out to children when they are not actually attending school. Um, at the same time, we also need to look at the quality of school meals, and there are guides in place both for the NSMP and for school tuck shops uh, that are meant to limit the consumption of sweet and sugary beverages and obesogenic foods. Um, but these are just guidelines, um, and they really need to be monitored and enforced if we're going to start to have an impact on child health and nutrition. And then last but not least, there's a concern that children will become increasingly sedentary and especially so during COVID. Um, but even pre-COVID, less than half of learners get sufficient daily exercise and one in three schools are without sporting facilities. So there's a real need also to look at creating safe and healthy school environments that, that promote sport. Um, and, and physical exercise, um, and particularly when we're looking at adolescent girls who, who may have safety concerns about exercising out in their communities. Fifth, we need to protect children from harmful business practices. Um, we know that international fast food companies spend over $5 million a day globally in marketing unhealthy foods to children. Um, and these companies are using incredibly sophisticated marketing techniques to exploit children's fantasies um, and build brand loyalty. And, and you'll see in the uh, um, McDonald's ad um, how the advert is tapping into the love and, and joy and connection between a, a daughter and her father. Um, so it's not just that these foods um, are sweet and salty and highly addictive and desirable because of taste. It's also that there's a sophisticated um, marketing machinery um, that is also at play and that is influencing our food choices in very powerful ways. Um, and for this reason, the World Health Assembly has called on states to protect children from the marketing of unhealthy food and beverages. Um, and in 2014, the National Department of Health introduced Regulation 429 that aimed to restrict the marketing of unhealthy food to children. But six years later, that's not been that's in part due to resistance and pushback from the food industry and also the advertising companies, the marketing companies um, that um, receive a significant stream of income um, from this kind of advertising. Lastly, we need to strengthen social protection, um, particularly in the context of rising unemployment and rising food prices um, that we've seen during COVID. Um, so the ECD subsidy is one example of social protection, um, but that reaches a very small proportion of young children. Um, whereas the CSG has much broader reach, um, but even there, it's only reaching four out of five young children in poor households. So there's a, there's a gap in coverage that we need to address. Um, as I've stated earlier, the, the grant amount falls below the food poverty line, so it's not sufficient to meet the child's daily energy requirements. And uptake is particularly low in that very first year of life. Um, and then the other um, source of support that's on the table is social relief of distress. Um, mm -hmm. And this includes DSD's Zero Hunger campaign that enables 
malnourished children to access um, social relief of distress in the form of either a voucher, food parcel, or, or cash. Um, but this in and of itself is, is, is possibly not enough. Again, social relief of distress is even smaller um, monthly um, amount than the CSG, both way below the food poverty line. So in a sense, they are entrenching um, this pattern of un undernutrition and, and stunting that we've seen. Um, and we also need to be thinking about things like the sugar tax um, to, which has helped limit or reduce consumption of, of sweet and sugary beverages such as Coke and Fanta. Um, so using taxes to limit consumption of unhealthy food and introducing subsidies to make a basket of healthy foods more affordable to South African families and their children. So essentially what we're calling for um, is really um, for a whole of government, whole of society approach um, to put children at the very heart of our food system. Um, and this is because children's nutrition is really a child rights imperative. Um, and the state has an immediate obligation um, through section 28 to respect, protect, promote and fulfill children's right to basic nutrition. And even in an economic crisis, the state may only introduce regressive measures um, as a very, very last resort. And they must ensure that the children are the very last to be affected. So we need to be really challenging, not only um, the closure of the NSNP, um, but similarly, Similarly, the grant amount, the CSG amount, which is in the way of um, the food poverty line, it's failed to keep up with inflation. So in a sense, what we've seen is the 10 Rand increase um, that was introduced earlier this year um, could be considered also a regressive measure that is selling children short. Um, and we know that both the UN Secretary General and the UN Committee on the rights of the child has really called on states to take active and immediate measures to ensure that children are fed nutritious food during the period of emergency, disaster, or lockdown. There are many, many things in, in life um, that we can wait for, um, but the child cannot wait. Now is the time that his bones are being formed, his mind developed. And to him, we cannot say tomorrow, his name is today. And the time to act is now. So I think that's um, essentially it. I just wanted to acknowledge the, the many, many contributors to the Gage and also to our, our poor funders and partners um, without whom the book would not have been possible. Um, and I really would welcome and invite your comments and questions um, and to explore ways that NACCW can help support the nutrition um, and food security of South Africa's children and families. So that's it from me. Oh, hi, everybody. I'm back again. Thank you so much. Uh, we applaud you, Laurie for such a beautiful presentation. Um, yeah, there are questions that we, we, we would like you to, to respond to them. I'll just read them here, and then maybe you, you can help us uh, go through them. Okay, Lori, I have noticed that most food we, we transferred taste nice. Now, after eating food we transferred, is there a way to deal with transfers in our bodies? That I don't know the answer to because I'm not a dietitian. Um, but I would recommend making contact with Dr. Chantal Witten um, to understand the challenges associated with, with trans fats. 
um, and what the options are. I think the, the, the intention is certainly to try and eliminate them as much as possible from the diet. Mm. And particularly the diet of our children. Yes. Okay, um, I think we are done about this session. Uh, thank you so much for your presence and the presentation. It was very informative and uh, we are taking a lot from it. I hope everybody who was uh, in this page listening to your presentation also took a lot from this presentation. So it means a lot to us to have you in our, in, our, uh, in, in this breakout session. So have a lovely day. And Thank you. Um, I think after this, there are other sessions. So other, if you can look at the programs, you will see there that we still have uh, sessions that are, are happening during the day. So whoever is um, uh, uh, here listening, please, after this, let's go join these other sessions and have a lovely day. Thank you so much to be our beautiful audience. Thank you to you, Laurie. Thank you. Thank you for making us so welcome. Thank you. Bye.